want to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7 in just a moment. As you are turning there, let me just say good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. We're grateful for those online as well. If you are one of our guests, we are glad you're here. We do hope you will stick around up to services. Let us get to know you and get to know us just a bit better. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Hear now the word of the true and living God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. Let us pray. Eternal and Almighty God, we are humbled by your timelessness, your eternality, and the reminder of the glorious work of you, the triune God, before time, throughout time, and even to the end of time. We pray that we would see clearly the things communicated by Paul in this writing. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I've entitled our study of the book of Ephesians, Basic Christianity. You know, there are any number of superlatives. Uh, you'll find phrases and statements about the book of Ephesians that speak of it in the most glowing terms. Just off the top of my head, I'm, I'm reminded of William Barclay's statement that Ephesians is the queen of the epistles. I would assume Romans is the king in that little scheme. But just the, the height of theology and, and doctrine and, and Christology and, and all of these things coming together as Paul puts pen to parchment all those years ago, it is just elevated in its view of God and in exalting God and exalting Christ. And that is all true. Someone has said that with Ephesians, you could drown an elephant. It's so deep. But also that it is shallow enough that a child could wade into it. And that is my hope as we study through this book over the next several weeks is that you'll gain an appreciation for the depth of it without drowning in it. Uh, that, that you'll recognize that indeed this contains basic Christianity. Just in these opening verses of the book. Verses 3 through 14 can be a bit mind-boggling, but also breathtaking in its scope. A number of doctrines all come together in these opening verses, the way it is written, Paul, it's as if he can't get it out of him fast enough. Because verses 3 through 14 are one big, long, run-on sentence. Now, for our English Bibles, most of them don't translate it that way. It is There's periods and uh, commas and breakups of thought and things like that for our benefit so that hopefully we can understand what it is Paul is communicating here. No doubt when this epistle arrived in Ephesus that first Sunday. Those who read it heard it and, and understood it. It is meant to be understood. In fact, in chapter 3 of this epistle, 
verse 4, Paul says, when you read this, you can perceive my uh, insight into the mystery of Christ. It's written in such a way that you're, you're supposed to understand it. It's assumed that you will understand it and gain an appreciation for the mystery of Christ. The basic breakdown of the book of Ephesians is pretty standard. You'll run across it in a number of different uh, uh, works. Basically, it's written in two halves. The first half, chapters 1 through 3, deal with the doctrine. Chapters 4 through 6 deal with our duty in light of the doctrine. Another way it's been phrased, chapters 1 through 3 deal with our, the, the riches with which God has blessed us. Chapters 4 through 6 deal with our responsibilities in light of those riches that have been poured about, out upon us. Chapters 1 through 3 deal with our calling in Christ. Chapters 4 through 6 deal with our conduct in light of our calling. Chapters 1 through 3 deal with what God has done on our behalf in Christ by the Spirit. Chapters 4 through 6 deal with how are we to live in light of what God has done. And it does get very practical right down to how do you handle your anger? What kind of things ought to come out of our mouths that are fitting for Christians? How should we conduct ourselves bodily in this world? How should we think about the home and the relationship between, say, husband wife, parent child? And of course, you have the extended discussion there about Spiritual warfare that closes out the book. A text that we spent weeks on in our Sunday morning Bible class. There's your plug, by the way, if you're not here for Sunday morning Bible class, you, you miss a lot. And we've gone in depth and detail into each piece of that armor, and we're just going to briefly cover it in the sermon series. But this is the book of Ephesians. This is the roadmap, as it were, for us in the weeks ahead. We want to deal with these first seven verses this morning, and again, they are packed with information. I hate to even break it up because, like I said, verses 3 through 14 are one long run on sentence. And in fact, there's a sense in which we can break this down with kind of a timeline. I'm going to use the, the background behind me as, as kind of this timeline. If you will, this here is the beginning of time. When everything starts creation, and it runs all the way over here, to this barrier, which is the end of time, when God will wrap everything up. God rolls everything out of the beginning. He's going to wrap everything up at the end. Right in the center of history is the cross. Yeah, Everything prior to it was looking forward to it. Everything after is looking back to it. But then we have this window here and this window here. And I'm, I'm grateful for the providential nature of this that we have these decorations up here that I can lean into them. You see, these, these windows, as it were, allow us a view, not just to a blank wall, which, you know, I guess it's decoration. I don't know. I'm a dude. <laughs> Women love this stuff, right? My wife has windows at home that go nowhere too. But, but this window in the theater of our imagination, we get to peer into it and we see the work of the triune God before time and we also get a glimpse of the triune God's work after time has wrapped up. We typically, because we're time-bound, linear creatures, we're somewhere over here, wherever that is, we think of this time over here as eternity past, and we think of this time over here as eternity future, but of course that doesn't, that doesn't do justice to the very nature of eternity and, and the timeless aspect of eternity. But again, for us, words fail us. We can break this text up and just read right through it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us over here in time, in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're, we're blessed here. But then notice, even as, just as, He, that is the Father, because that's who's under discussion here, He chose us, that's Christians, including Paul and Tychicus, who are specifically named in this text, 
even as He chose us, in Him, in, in Christ. But notice the timestamp before the foundation of the world. Here's your first glimpse. And you get, there are so few of these in the text of Scripture, but every now and again, we get to peer into the window of eternity past or eternity future, and we get, we get some insight, some revelation of what God was up to before the foundation of the world. And here, Paul says, as we look to the window, what we see, what has been revealed is, He, the Father, chose us, Christians, in Christ. That's what was going on over here. And we're already getting, we're already starting to lean into the doctrine of the Trinity because you have the Father in, con, in conjunction with the Son. That, here's the purpose, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Now, that's certainly true here. We, because of Jesus, we are holy and blameless in His presence. But I also think it just it gives us some intimation of what's coming in terms of before Him. That's presence language. When we are finally in the very presence of God, uninterrupted by this physical nature as it exists now, but now we have these new spiritual bodies and we're in His presence, holy and blameless could be, could be, in love. Notice again, He, the Father, predestined us. And I think this predestination stuff, the, the, the time stamp relates to this as well. That the predestining work of God takes place. We get another glimpse through the window. He predestined us as Christians. But notice, it's for adoption as sons. Through Christ Jesus, that takes place over here. Where we have been adopted, that's family language. Marvelous family language. In other words, God, here in eternity past, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they, they pictured a divine family that we get to be a part of, that we're adopted into. And we have all of the privileges and blessings that go along with that. Four sons through Jesus Christ, for according to the purpose of His will, which is an interesting statement. And that may just kind of overarch this whole thing. God working his, the purpose of His will throughout all of time and space from eternity to eternity. But also related to this, to the praise of His glorious grace. That that is part of what's going on here, the, the praise of God's grace. But it all leads to over here, after time is no more, and we're with God forever, and He is glorified for how gracious He was to us sinners. With which He has blessed His grace. He has, in fact, the, the way this is written in the original could be translated, uh, His grace with which He graced us. And indeed, we have been graced by His grace. His grace. He has freely bestowed that grace upon us. But notice, in the beloved. Don't miss that. In the beloved. It's Jesus. And it speaks to the Father's love of the Son. That the Father loves the Son. Jesus. And it's out of that love that the Father has for Him that He's, he's working all of this out. And we... We get to be the beneficiaries of what God has done and what He's accomplished. In Him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through His blood. Every time you read blood in the New Testament, you're supposed to go right back to the cross because that is where Jesus shed His blood. Where the nails were driven into His sacred flesh. Where, where He had the crown of thorns placed upon His head. It is the blood of Jesus shed on the cross that gives us redemption. Redemption is a word that has to do with well, the idea of slavery. That we were slaves of sin and Satan and death and, and even hell itself. And there was a price that was placed upon our head that we could never pay. The record of our debt because of our sin was astronomical. No one could pay it. You couldn't pay it. You couldn't pay it. I couldn't pay it. 
And, and so here we are on the auction block as slaves of sin. And it's Jesus who steps forward and says, I'll pay it. And by the way, he's the only one who could do that being both God and man. He is the God man. And as God, according to his human nature, he goes to the cross and he dies. And it's on the cross when he dies that he pays the price for you and for me to purchase us back from slavery to sin. Now we have the forgiveness of our trespasses. Christ, his blood is what forgives us. But notice it is our trespasses over here because that's where we live and move and have our being. And it's all of our trespasses, by the way. Every last one of them. Trespass, by the way, you understand. Don't, do not trespass, right? You see a do not trespass sign. And there, there's a boundary there that you're not supposed to cross. Well, in a similar way, God has, has laid out the boundary lines. And guess what we do? And we trespass. God said, don't do this, and we do it. Or he said, do this, and we don't do it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You do that perfectly? No, nope, neither do I. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You do that perfectly? No, nope, neither do I. We trespass. Ah, but the blood. Here's gospel. Ready? It's the blood of Jesus that forgives our trespasses. Forgive. Forgiveness has to do with being. They're sent away. You're never going to see them again. The scripture talks about how as far as the east is from the west, so God has separated us from our sins. They're gone, taken away, forgotten, never to be remembered. According to the riches of His grace, that's God's grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. We'll have to pick up with the rest of this text next time because I want to dig into some of these things. And the first question that I want to address is how He has blessed, God has blessed us, the Father even, has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How is it that we can possess these blessings? And I know there are a number of, of ways in which humans have, have schemed and thought of how it is that we gain access to the blessings of God. And, and even, even non-human beings, like angels. I think about Satan and his angels. How, how they thought they could storm heaven by force. No, no, you, you, don't, you don't take the blessings of God by force. You don't force God. You, you can't demand, you owe me blessings, give me blessings. No, you don't do that, you creature from the dust. Who do we think we are? By the way, how'd that work out for Satan and his angels, right? They're cast out and conquered. But also, again, some think you, you got to do X, Y, and Z. You got to do a certain number of, of good things. And then somehow you, through good work, have unlocked the Rubik's Cube of blessings and heaven and all that. And, and so you try and earn these blessings. But it doesn't work that way either. Not by works, lest anyone should boast, is what Paul will say when we get to chapter 2, which is an echo of, of things he says elsewhere. 2 Timothy chapter 1, about verse 9, maybe verse 10. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It is not because of righteous things that we have done. You cannot build your stairway to heaven. You can't do enough good works. And by the way, our best works are always tinged with unrighteousness. Our righteous deeds are nothing more than filthy rags in the sight of the holy, holy, holy God. So says Isaiah. Maybe you think you can buy your way to heaven. You don't have the spiritual currency in your spiritual bank account to do that. 
More than that, it is Jesus who says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the ones who recognize you are a spiritual pauper in the very presence of God. And the, you are reduced to begging because you know you can't afford the price tag. None of these ways get us to heaven. None of these ways bring us God's blessing. We are told here that we are blessed in Christ. That's it. In Christ is a favorite term of Paul. He uses it many times in his writings. It depends on who you ask, but anywhere from 164 to 176 total times, that phrase, in Christ, will show up in his works. We're talking Romans, we're talking Corinthians, we're talking Thessalonians. All of, all of Paul's works in Christ shows up over 160 times. It's a phrase that points to our union with Christ. That we are united with Christ. And because we are united with Christ, ready? We're blessed. You see, you don't take it by force. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. It is Christ and Christ alone through His work and His, complete, His accomplished work that we have these blessings. It is in Christ and only in Christ. You will not get this from Muhammad. You will not get it from Krishna. You will not get it from Buddha. You will not get it from Joseph Smith. You're not going to get it anywhere else. It is only in Christ. What are these blessings? So many, even in these first seven verses. Number one, Paul talks about the will of God. God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Talk about a blessing for us, right? His will, and it's according to His will, as we'll find out when we get down to verse 11. It is according to the counsel of His will that He is working all things out. We are are creatures of today. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't even know what's going to happen in the next 30 minutes. I mean, you're, you assume I'm going to wrap the sermon up within that time, right? But we really don't know. You don't know what's going to happen in a minute. But God does. And, and to know that we live according to the counsel of His will, no matter what we're going through, no matter what's going to face us in the future, we live according to that will. We are saints, holy ones. And let me just emphasize here that saints, Paul's not writing to, you know, Saint Joseph who happens to live in Ephesus, right? Who, who's this super guy who's done all these great and amazing things, maybe done a miracle or two, and he has qualified himself as a saint. That's not the way sainthood works. These saints, every Christian in Ephesus, every Christian who's ever lived, we are all saints. All Christians are saints. All saints are Christians. Right? Um, that is, we've all been set apart by God to serve Him, to be holy in His presence, to do the work that He's marked out for us. Sainthood. Talk about a blessing. That, that God is the one who makes us holy. He has set us apart to that we should be holy and blameless before Him. We read that, right? That's, that speaks to our status as saints, that we are holy before God. It is Again, it's not because of anything we've done. We are not holy in and of ourselves. God gives us holiness. He's the one who sets us apart. We're also faithful. Faith. In God, faith in Christ, I mean, that's part of the idea of faith. We have the, the proper objects of our faith. Our faith is in Christ, in God, and only in Christ, only in God. They're the only proper objects of our trust. But also faithfulness is continuing in the faith. You, you keep on persevering in the faith. You don't turn loose of faith. And what a marvelous thing to be counted among the faithful. We believe. But then we put that faith into action. Grace and peace there in verse 2. Man, God's grace. And indeed, we, we read earlier, uh, the grace with which He's graced us. 
And God's grace, is it sufficient or not? Of course it's sufficient. His grace is sufficient. And also His peace. Peace from God. That is, we are at peace with our Maker. Only because of Christ. But also, that puts us at peace with one another. And, and Paul is going to expound upon that more when we get to chapter 2. Verse 4 talks about how God, the Father, He chose us in Christ. That choice that takes place before the foundation of the world. Again, what a marvelous thing. He chose us. Not because of anything that we've done. Not because we're so big and bad. He's the one who did that. He also here predestined us. Again, that, that work that takes place beforehand. The work of determining that you would be adopted as sons. Talk about the blessing of being part of His family right now. That we, we get to approach God not as judge or just our Creator, our Maker, He's our Father. And we as sons, as daughters, we have His ear. And we can come to Him any time with, with anything that's burdening us. And He cares for us. He invites us. Cast all of your anxieties and worries upon Him. Again, it's through Jesus Christ, though. It is only through Christ. It is only in Christ that we have these blessings to the praise of His glorious grace, or the grace of His glory. Again, that grace, the, and then the redemption. I, I mentioned that earlier, the redemption here. You've been bought back. You know, the psalmist says in the Psalms, you, you can't ransom, you can't pay the price to ransom another person's soul. You can't even ransom your own soul, which is why God steps forward and pays the ransom price. He rescues us by ransom. And He pays the price gladly through the blood. And it's only through Christ's blood that we have this redemption. All of our sins, all of our trespasses forgiven. And all of this according to the riches of God's grace. We didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It is unmerited favor. And He graces us with it. What we read here is that what God determined beforehand in time, and that's what verse 7 begins now, in time, He's accomplished that in Christ. And, and as we continue to walk through this, we're going to see more and more of what God did. Because he's, he's the focus of this. God is the, 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 the primary object of this discussion. God acted. And it's because of this divine action that we have all of these marvelous blessings. But God determined that He, God the Son, would enter into His own creation, take on flesh, live among us the sinless life we could not live, go to the cross and die the death that was due us, the punishment for our sins was placed upon Him, die in our place for our sins, be buried for three days, but on the third day rise from the dead, for the glory of God the Father, and ascend back to the Father's right hand, where He lives and rules forevermore, and He will come again from there someday. From eternity to eternity, we see God at work. Let me close with just a, one more remark about the sufficiency of God's grace, because God's grace is sufficient. Not just necessary, but it's sufficient. If you go to buy a car, and they got all kinds of cars, right? And, and they come equipped at varying levels. You know, there's you can get like a, a base package that's going to be kind of like my Jeep. I have a Jeep that doesn't have power locks. All right, it doesn't have power windows. You got got the old hand crank, right? And and some of you may be like, they still make cars like that, you know? But that's, that's my Jeep. It has power steering, fortunately, but uh, it has AC, fortunately, uh, and heat. Go figure. But you can get that base model, right? 
Or, I mean, you can go all the way up. You can get some pretty fancy bells and whistles, right? Not just with the power locks and the power windows and the power everything else. Seats that warm up, right? But sometimes, yeah, you can get those cars. They don't have anything. And maybe you want some of those things, right? Or, or maybe it's kind of like, you know, I know Christmas time is a long way away, but, you know, Christmas time you get kids these gifts, they get them toys, right? And sometimes, sometimes you read on the box it says batteries not included, right? So, so you get the toy, but there's no power, right? The thing is, when it comes to God's grace, it's not just the base model car with no power or anything. God's grace is not like a toy that doesn't have any power to it. When it comes to His grace, it comes with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Power, batteries, all of it is included in Christ. Every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. Our God really is that gracious, and it, His grace is more than sufficient for everything that we need. We are unimaginably blessed in Christ Jesus, but we on, you only have access to those blessings in Christ. Only in Christ, and no other. He's the one who has secured all these blessings. The blessing of being faithful saints of God. The blessing of God chose us, God predestined, God adopted us by His grace, for His glory. The blessing of redemption through Christ and what He did on the cross. The blessing of the forgiveness of all of our sins. Yes, all these blessings. Count them, my brothers. Count them, my sisters. Blessings all mine. And 10,000 besides. Let's commit this to prayer. Father, we, we only scratch the surface sometimes of identifying what a truly blessed people we are. And all these things All these things are overwhelming to us. And yet we, by faith, acknowledge that in them You reveal Yourself to be the Almighty, the All-Wise, the All-Good God. We pray, Father, that we would never take these blessings for granted, that we would continue to look to Christ and put our faith, our trust only in Him. And that we would see You as a good, good Father because that is who You are. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.